Great, thanks. So, Bella, you know, going to the next slide here, we, we've kind of got room for interpretation. We also have, you know, what's the reasonable, uh, you know, standard uh, for inquiry. Uh, can you kind of help us through some of the challenges of that reasonable standard of inquiry? Uh, so again, the, the we'd like to think about these challenges in two, uh, two distinct buckets. One is the how each company interprets their exposure to the to the rules. So there's various terms that have been loosely defined or intentionally the SEC has left room for uh, interpretation. I mean, if you are like I say, if you're if you're in a, a pessimist, you'll call it. Uh, uh, you know, badly defined. If you are an optimist, you would call it as you know flexibility, and you know you can. <laughs> right? so it, 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 it all comes down to perspective. So we we typically encourage companies to work with their legal counsel to determine uh, how certain terms apply to each company. And things like contract to manufacture, necessary to the functionality, necessary to produ for production, which has largely been de scoped. So talk about a little bit about contract to manufacture. You know. Okay, so I mean, contract to manufacture primarily applies to retailers. Um, this is something that got introduced uh, uh, in the final rule, and and what the rule says is that the, the proposed rule said that if you are a retailer that carried any private label, or you you, you pretty much uh, were responsible for reporting out. The final rule, the SEC cut retailers some slack and said that uh, you have to contract to manufacture and then laid out a few guidelines for what would be contractor manufacture. It still leaves a lot of room for interpretation. For example, you know, you know, some, some example throughout is, uh, what if a retailer basically says, uh, I like the product that a manufacturer is making, it's off the catalog, but I want it at a lower price point. Right? I mean, is that enough contract to manufacture? I mean, you know, you are, are you influencing the manufacturing of the product to a sufficient degree that now you are responsible for the minerals that go into it, or is the manufacturer on the hook for that? You know, th then there's the issue of uh, unbranded items in, in, your, in your store, you're a, a retailer carrying them, who is responsible for answering them? So the contract to manufacture issues has caused a lot of, uh, you know, I would say discussions to ha take place amongst retailers that you know, we are part and parcel of uh, on a day-to-day on -day basis, and this is something that retailers have tackled actively through RELA as well. Uh, necessary to the functionality. Again, I mean, it's, it comes down, like, I'll give you some examples probably here that you know, if, if you are a, a cell phone, if you are a telecommunications company, right, uh, we, you know, what if, is, is the tower that's used for your, uh, uh, for, for your communication, is that necessary for the production of your product? So it depends on how the telecom company would define the product, right? We've seen broad, you know, examples across the spectrum of very conservative and very, uh, you know, liberal definitions, but it comes down to, again, what do you define as a product, and how do you, you as a company, how do you define which of these pieces of equipment is necessary to the functionality of your product? So uh, uh, another example that, you, you know, you, you bring up often is, maybe you should talk about your, uh, your, your packaging, maybe. A lot of it is a jewelry company that has a box that people identify that box with the jewelry. It's decorative in nature, but is it necessary to the functionality of the end product? Some people might just go to the store just to get the box, perhaps. And if that Not box my happened, wife. She wants what's inside. <laughs> <laughs> but if that, if, and I'm making an assumption here, but if that box included the conflict minerals, could they argue because they're so widely known with that box that it's necessary to the functionality of their production? I think a lot of it is going to come up to interpretation, working in industry groups, working with legal counsel. A lot of companies that we've seen have perhaps been a little bit more conservative in scoping and what is, because it is a filing requirement and it is the first year that companies are actually doing this. They're perhaps expanding their net a little bit wider than what would be in future years just in order to collect the information, in order to be able to file something with the SEC that they feel is truthful. At the end of the day, and on contract to manufacture too, a lot of companies perhaps do not have a definition of what that is. If you've got decentralized operations around the world and you decide at the top of your the shop what contract to manufacture is, do you have an extra step where you now have to go around the world to ensure all your operations are applying that new definition correctly in order to scope in all your products? 
So there's a lot of different pragmatic uh, examples that come out. I, I think when the SEC put the rules together, they were trying to take in all the comments that they got from various industry groups and so on, but the actual operationalization of this could be quite onerous for companies, at least in year one, in trying to define what these terms are and applying it to your operations. Right, and those are just the definitions, Tom. Then there's a whole issue of the, 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 the supply chain complexity, right? I mean, uh, I come from the world of supply chain, and typically this is the nightmare scenario for people working in supply chains, especially for large and complex companies. I mean, you have a day job to take care of, and then on top of that, you got, you're now being asked to do the due diligence and then working with your suppliers. Um, you know, and, and supply chains uh, you know, are, are complex. I mean, you, you, there, there are several layers. You are, as a company, several layers removed from the smelter or the mine, and you being asked to identify wh who the smelter are, you've got to reach out to your suppliers who may not always cooperate with you. They may be based in a foreign land when they say, why should we answer these questions for you? So those are some of the practical issues. And then you turn to the OECD guidelines, and there's very little in the OECD guidelines about how to actually go about doing the due diligence, right? So those are some of the practical issues, but fortunately, there are several industry groups that have started working on them. I mean, the lead has been taken by the EICC, Jesse, for the electronics industry. They've come up with a brilliant program, the Conflict-Free Smelter Program. They've come up with a standard questionnaire that is becoming widely used outside the electronics industry. Uh, you know, a lot of other industries are taking it and saying, this is a good approach, let's go around it. And then frankly, I mean, as you go a few layers down the supply chain, your, your, your manufacturers uh, are agnostic to which industry you supply. So as long as you take some of the best practices developed by the industry groups and you work with them, there are ways around it. And the electronics industry has shown that there's a way around it. Amy, some of the challenges the legal departments will face with this? Well, I think we've been discussing those. I mean, just trying to interpret the rules. I mean, this is an SEC filing requirement, so the legal department does need to be involved and needs to work with the supply chain folks to try to figure out how the rules are going to apply to them and make sure that they're able to include the required disclosures. I um, was curious if any of you guys had heard anything similar or contradictory to that rumor. Uh, the question, just, yeah, oh, you gotta go we'll repeat it, yeah. The question is whether or not it's true, the rumor that the SEC is going to come out with some additional guidance regarding some of the definitions in the rules. You I said, heard the rumor, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody told me in the back corner. <laughs> but I, I think that... Um, Mary Shapiro was pretty adamant when they actually approved the rule that no further guidance was coming out. With that being said, uh, I, I guess post-election, that could change things after tomorrow, whether or not um, they're going to continue to pursue, uh, whether there's a stay in the rule or more guidance is coming out. I, I, don't, I can't confirm or deny, to be quite honest. Yeah, I'm not sure. 